Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on cap and trade. This will be the fifth event of the World Bank Knowledge Sharing Series on low carbon and climate smart cities. My name is Victor Mulas, and I am the team lead of the World Bank Tokyo Development Learning Center, or TDLC in short, which is the organizer of this series. TDLC is a partnership between the World Bank and the government of Japan that serves as a global hub of Japanese and global urban development knowledge and technical expertise for practical operationalization. Today's event will be on the topic of carbon pricing with focus on cap and trade program. But before we begin, please let me make a few housekeeping announcements. First, this webinar offers English and Japanese simultaneous interpretation. The sessions are in English, but the Q&A session one and three will be in Japanese. Please select the language of your choice by clicking the interpretation tool, which is the globe icon on the tool menu of Zoom. We recommend you to do that now. So if you are going to listen in English, just choose in the globe icon the option of English. And if you are listening in Japanese, please uh, choose the Japanese option. That would ease uh, the, your uh, enjoyment and, uh, of the seminar because when it changes into the other language, you will not notice anything. If you choose to uh, do it when the Q&A session happens, please remember to do so at that time. Second, throughout the webinar, if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat space because we will have these Q&A sessions at the end of each presentation. So uh, please, as the questions come to your mind, feel free to just put them in the, in the, in the chat space the questions can be both in English or Japanese, and the TDLC chat master will bring your question to the speaker and moderator. And finally, please note that this event will be recorded, and the recordings will be available on TDLC website after the event. Now let's get started with the session. For today's programs, we begin with the opening remarks from Francis Kesquier, who is the practice manager of the World Bank's Urban Resilience and land global practice in the East Asia Pacific. Francis couldn't be present here with us, but he has sent his recording from Singapore, which we will share with you now. So please, can we share the recording now of Francis? Hello everyone, and thank you again for joining the knowledge sharing series on low carbon and climate smart cities. And this is the fifth event, I believe, of this series. And today uh, we will be discussing how low carbon initiatives, such as carbon pricing, can foster uh, resilient, sustainable, and climate smart cities. Uh, the purpose of this knowledge sharing series is to share practical experience and emerging trends from Japan and other countries on the development of low carbon and climate smart cities and hold open conversation between practitioner, civic leader, private sector partners, and other stakeholders about a variety of topic. Now, as you know, COP26, which started uh, in Glasgow a bit more than a week ago, focused on how to deliver on the promise of the Paris Agreement. Uh, the first week saw major pledges from world leaders, including on cutting methane emission, tackling deforestation, phasing out coal, driving clean technology, et cetera, et cetera. And indeed, we need urgent action at all levels and in all sectors if we are to achieve uh, the goal of carbon neutrality embedded in the Paris Agreement. Now, cities have to be part of this equation. Although cities occupy only 2% of all land area, they consume over two third of the world's energy and in one way or another are responsible for over 70% of global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Now, we all know that urban centers share of emission is bound to grow. Cities are main growth engine of the modern world uh, and we will continue to see uh, rural to urban migration uh, all around the world. People searching for better li livelihood, people who are migrating due to conflict or increasingly, in fact, frequent uh, climate disasters. In fact, uh, by 2050, uh, we can expect 2.5 uh, 
additional people living in cities around the world. Now, if managed well, cities' physical and economic density can provide the impetus for technological change and infrastructure investment that support low carbon development. A good example is simply the shape of cities uh, with, uh, with dictate the preference for public transit use or allow for people not to have to transit uh, and shop and work and live uh, at the same place rather than have to commute uh, to all these different locations. This has huge impact on GHG emission. And I think some of the knowledge exchange we've had have already discussed some of these topics. Uh, today, we'll, we'll talk more about how this intervention can be financed. Uh, we will go beyond what interventions are needed to look at how uh, finance can be mobilized to uh, support action. And we will look in particular at carbon pricing, an approach to reducing GSG emission that uses a market mechanism to pass cost of emitting carbon to the emitters. In fact, the polluter uh, pays principle. Globally, there has been a steady progress in adopting and implementing carbon pricing initiatives over the years. 64 pricing initiatives were implementing in 2021 alone, covering 45 nations, 35 subnational jurisdiction, and many, many cities, representing 21.5% of global GHG emissions. Uh, an increasing number of these jurisdictions are also applying emission trading schemes or cap and trade systems. Uh, in 2021, ETS were operating across four continents in, four, in 38 countries, representing 40% of the world's GDP. Uh, and additional systems are actually being discussed in many other countries. So today, uh, we will learn about the Tokyo Cap and Trade Program and the Thailand Voluntary ETS Program uh, from experts of both the public and the private sectors. These include Mr. Uh, Tomotaka Aoki from Emission Cap and Trade Section at the Climate Change and Energy Division in the Bureau of Environment uh, of the Tokyo Metropolitan Government. We will hear from Mr. Patham uh, Chaya Bruksaton. Uh, the Carbon Market Manager at the Thailand Greenhouse Gas Management Organization, and from Mr. Koichirio uh, Gunda, Senior General Manager, Data Center Service Group at Canon IT Solution. Uh, and before I give you back the floor, uh, Victor, let me, let me put a special word to thank, again, the Government of Japan uh, for its support to the World Bank Tokyo Development Learning Center, uh, which is organizing the event today. Uh, thank you to everyone also for participating. Thank you uh, to Taisei for moderating this event uh, later, and Joe and Harry and Huyen for providing comment and reflection on how to structure uh, the, the session today. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for your participation. Have a great, uh, a great uh, exchange of views. Over to you, Victor. Thank you very much, uh, Francis, uh, for kicking us off uh, with your welcoming remarks and, and thank you for the effort uh, to, uh, with your busy schedule to at least uh, uh, being able to, to send these uh, remarks uh, uh, recorded and being present in the event. So now we, we will uh, start with the sessions of the event. Today's event has three sessions and they will be moderated by Taisei Matsuki, who is a senior climate change specialist at the World Bank. Taise has been instrumental at curating this series uh, and working uh, with the team in bringing you all the relevant content and directions that this series has taken. And I'm very pleased that he will be able to join us today to moderate these sessions. So now I would like to invite Taise to the stage. Taise, the floor is yours. Thank you, Victor. Can you see me? Okay, great. Let me start. Yes. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to the session and the webinar. My name is Taisei Matsuki, a senior climate change specialist based in Washington. Good to see you. So today, I think we have, I take care of the, I take care of the moderating the three sessions. And then let me start with session one, the policy initiatives on cap and trade program. 
concepts and learnings from Tokyo Metropolitan Government. As some of you know, the Tokyo, Tokyo has started a cap and trade program since 2010, and then it was very successful. Then it reduced 27% of greenhouse gas emission compared with the base years. And then it was actually the first urban cap and trade program covering large facilities. And then also the, before the starting the cap and trade program, I think they spent eight years to get this, this stakeholders support and understanding. So as you know, the many countries now considering about the carbon price instrument as a core mitigation policies to tackle with greenhouse gas emissions. So many countries had also suffering from the say, rapid urbanization. That is why Tokyo's experience might be the very useful for the policy makers and legislators. Today, we have a very good expert from Tokyo Metropolitan Government, Mr. Tomotaka Aoki. As Ed Francis said, he's going to the Emission Cap and Trade Section and Climate Change and Energy Division, a Bureau of Environment, Tokyo Metropolitan Government. And we also had a very excellent commentator from World Bank colleague, the Joseph Dixon Carlisle Pryor, Senior Climate Specialist. He had experience in the say, Australian ETS. So I think you know, we can see the lots of very fruitful discussion. Okay, Mr. Aoki, floor is yours. Mr. Aoki, perhaps ah. you're on mute. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matsuki. Hello, my name is Tomotaka Aoki from TMG, the Tokyo Metropolitan Government. And I am a member of, um, I'm a member of operation team of the Tokyo Cap and Trade Program. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to share our experiences implementing this program. For this presentation, I'd like to share with you the overview of the Tokyo Cap and Trade Program. So let's begin. Before we get into the main point, please let me briefly introduce the Tokyo's climate change strategies and policy frameworks. To achieve the 2050 goal of net zero CO2 emissions, TMG formulated zero emission Tokyo strategy in 2019. Since then, the world has been facing an unprecedented crisis with the spread of COVID-19, and the climate crisis has become even more serious. TMG recognizes that we are in a historical turning point in the climate change measures. This strategy summarizes our vision for realizing the 1.5 degrees goal, as well as tangible measures and roadmaps. This slide shows Tokyo's energy related CO2 emissions, which total 55.5 million tons in 2019. The pie chart on the left shows a breakdown of Tokyo's CO2 emissions by sector. And as you can see, more than 70% of emissions come from buildings. On the right side, the chart shows the share of CO2 emissions from industrial and commercial sectors. Compared to over 600,000 small, medium-sized facilities, the number of large facilities is only 1,200. However, these large facilities are responsible for 40% of the CO2 emissions from these sectors. This is why our cap and trade program targets buildings, specifically these large sized large size facilities. This slide shows Tokyo's environment policy framework, specifically for buildings covering from the planning stage to operation stage. TMG has developed policies according to, according to building types and sizes. So now let's move on to the overview of the program. The origin of the program is a mandatory CO2 emission reporting program, which started in 2002. This program mandated large facilities with high CO2 emissions to submit their emission data and plans to reduce emissions. However, setting an emission reduction target was voluntary. As we recognize the shortcomings of the voluntary program, TMG resolved to introduce a mandatory emissions reduction program. 
our intentions were to create a positive environment for investment in energy saving and renewable energy to create consensus among stakeholders and achieve significant emissions reduction in these sectors. Based on the accumulated data from the previous program, we amended the ordinance and implemented monetary reduction program in 2010, which is the Tokyo cap and trade program. This program is the world's first urban cap and trade scheme for large cities, which covers commercial and office buildings as well as factories. The threshold of this program is an annual energy consumption of 1,005 kiloliters or more crude oil equivalent. Out of all the covered facilities, approximately 1,000 are commercial and office buildings, and 200 are industrial factories or water supply and sewage facilities. As you can see from this flowchart, we gradually evolved the voluntary reporting program and based on the accumulated data, introduced the Tokyo Cap and Trade Program in 2010. We call this a hop step jump approach. Following these steps, we have developed our laws and regulations. The table shows the comparison among three phases. The efforts made in the hop and step phases were essential to implement the mandatory reduction program successfully in terms of later correction and raising awareness among all the stakeholders. This slide shows an outline of this program in more detail. I will point at some key points. First, facility owners are primarily responsible for emission reductions. Second, verification by a third party institution is mandatory. And thirdly, we impose a penalty for shortages when facilities do not meet their reduction targets, as you can see in the last line of the table. Setting effecting caps is the key to achieving emission reduction targets. We set five year compliance periods for caps and strengths the compliance factors step by step. We set the period for five years so that covered facilities have time to making decisions for equipment replacement. Therefore, reducing their emissions with long time perspective. For the current compliance period, the compressed factors are now 27% or 25%, depending on the types of facilities. So how does each covered facility achieve the emission reduction target? This slide summarizes the choices. First, covered facilities will reduce their CO2 emissions with their own measures, such as retrofitting, improvement of operation and use of low carbon energy. Second, if there are reduction shortages, they can achieve the target by buying certain credits. There are five different types of credits for this program as shown on the slide. And thirdly, if there is an excess emission reduction from the previous compliance period, the covered facility can use the reduction for the current compliance period. This is called the banking. Now, I'd like to move on to the incentive schemes for this program. First one is top level facility certification. Facilities that have already made outstanding progress with measures against climate change are formally recognized as top level or nearly top level facilities by the governor to reward their early actions. Their compliance factor is reduced to one half or three quarters respectively. Top level and nearly top level facilities are assessed on over 200 items, such as the energy performance of a building and equipment. We have awarded 64 facilities in total through this scheme, which is equivalent to 5% of all the covered facilities. This certification has been well recognized and it is effective as an incentive for further reduction. In addition, the guideline for the certification is now used as reference by major developers for the planning of construction and new buildings in Tokyo are now being designed to satisfy the requirements 
for top level facility certification. Last but not least, this certification is also used as a global ESG benchmark for real assets. This slide shows some real examples of top level facility. Top level facilities often have an outlook that can be a landmark of the area, and they all have high environmental performance. These buildings also have outstanding operational measures, such as optimized air ventilation control and proper timing of starting up air conditioning before using rooms. The middle photo is Nish Tokyo Data Center owned by Can IT Solutions, and they will be speaking their experiences at session three. Another unique incentive scheme to this program is for tenants. While we set reduction obligations on facility owners, there are sometimes a split incentive scheme incentive issue between building owners and tenants. To ensure owners compliance, all tenants have an obligation to cooperate on the owner's energy saving measures. I will not go into details due to the time limit, but as shown in the figure bottom right, we also evaluate and disclose extreme tenants on the website. Now let's move on to the current results of this program. As you can see from the graph, total emissions of the covered facilities for fiscal year 2019 was significantly reduced by 27% from the base year emissions. Also, as the pie chart on the right shows, approximately 80% of covered facilities achieved reduction obligations through their own measures for the second compliance period. This slide shows major energy efficiency and measures taken by the covered facilities. As you can see from this table, covered facilities have taken various measures and most popular measures include such as installation of high efficiency lighting and energy saving control. Also, more and more facilities are now selecting low carbon electricity or heat, as you can see in the table at the bottom. How about comparing the outcomes with economic activity? On this graph, the thick line shows the CO2 emissions from the covered facilities of this program. This normal line shows those of both the commercial and industrial sectors of Tokyo, and the dotted line is national energy consumption. As you can see, facilities under this program have reduced their emissions drastically. Therefore, it's fair to say that the Tokyo Cap and Trade program has played a significant role in this remarkable result. Next, I will briefly explain our carbon market. The first one is price for credits. And the table showed the recent appraised price of most commonly traded credits. Appraised means that an appraiser estimates the price of a standard transaction based on the information collected through interview surveys of market participants. Price for excess emission reductions is relatively low due to the fact that most facilities have successfully reduced their emissions below the cap level for the previous compliance period. Hence, there is a lower demand for credits. For renewable energy credits, the price has been relatively high in recent years because of most interest and investment into renewable energy reflecting the Paris Agreement. Next, you can see on the second table that approximately 22 million tons of credits have been issued. As for transactions, um, there have been over 500 cases totaling around 5 million tons of CO2. Before moving on to my last slide, let me briefly introduce Tokyo's policy update. Since we recognize that the actions taken during the decade to the 2030 are crucial in achieving the 2050 goal, 
TMG is advocating 2030 carbon half style in order to have our carbon output by 2030 through subtle changes and a vision of a better future. Today, I introduced and explained our Tokyo Cap and Trade program. This program, and it, this program is an effective measure to reduce CO2 emissions substantially. And I hope my outlining of our work in Tokyo has helped you understand our approach. For more detail on our program, please access our website and Facebook. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Aoki. It's excellent uh, presentation, which is very detailed, but it's very helpful to understand. Okay, Joe, uh, you have the floor, and please make it compact, perhaps a couple of minutes, please. No problems. And, and thank you, Mr. Aoki, for that excellent presentation. A lot of information, and I learned a lot, so thank you very much. Uh, so my background is, is carbon pricing from a, a, a national a jurisdiction perspective. And I thought that there were a number of elements that you uh, spoke about, which had a, a much broader um, applicability and, and some interesting design aspects that I just wanted to touch on. The first was on, on the phased introduction. And I think that's a, it's a common policy that's used. In fact, I think every ETS that's currently in place currently use, uh, had implemented through a phased introduction. And it's a really good way to, to um, uh, both collect data, but also get uh, uh, stakeholders um, familiar with the systems, but also uh, to uh, generate um, acceptance of the policy. Uh, the second element I wanted to touch on was the uh, and highlight was the, the flexibility that the, uh, uh, the the Tokyo Cap and Trade Program provides, and and uh, one in particular which is quite interesting is the, uh, the the length of the compliance period of five years. Um, which is, is different from, from quite a, a, a lot of other jurisdictions. Um, and that provides, particularly coupled with that banking aspect that you mentioned, um, additional flexibilities for business to then manage the timing of their investments uh, along those uh, uh, greater flexibility on compliance arrangements. Uh, there's also in terms of flexibility that, that internal reductions versus the, the, um, uh, the reductions on, on uh, through renewable energy certificates or, or different types of offsets. So that's uh, allowed to not just generate ex uh, stakeholder acceptance, but also the potential to um, um, uh, um, deliver other more broader policy objectives. And then the last thing I wanted to emphasize, which I thought was really interesting, uh, some of the, the novel design aspects that, that you've introduced to tackle non uh, price drivers and barriers. And the first one is in relation to the, the top level facilities aspect. And I thought that was really interesting and, and trying to tackle, uh, uh, go from the behavioral aspect. Um, and, and that it's interesting that these like non-price aspects can actually be very powerful drivers. And I've witnessed this from, an, from I guess, the, uh, the inverse in both Australia and California, where the prospect of being named and shamed as being a non-compliant entity can actually be almost as powerful a driver as the, the financial penalty itself. Um, and then similarly, the other novel aspect on, in terms of a split incentive. And I know that this is uh, an issue that policymakers everywhere, particularly in relation to energy efficiency in, in uh, particularly in buildings, um, they all grapple with. And so I think that the, this novel sort of dual reporting requirements and compliance requirements is is a really interesting aspect that I think others could uh, learn from in terms of trying to better tackle this split incentive issue. So thank you very much for the presentation uh, and I'll, I'll leave my comments there. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. I think we received the three questions, uh, I think so far. I think, you know, uh, if part, due to the time limit, I think maybe I would like to give you the three questions and then within your time, if you can answer, please answer the three questions. The first question is how Tokyo uh, can ensure the emission qualifications, uh, you know, systems transparency when you grant certificate and do you create expert team for the program? This is question number one. Number two, is, do you have a long-term monitoring system for the certified companies. The third one is 
What was the feedback from certified companies and other entities around the companies? Do you think the qualification which you selected could be used in other cities? So these are three questions. Of course, you can see the question in Japanese. So Mr. Aoki, do you think AI uh, can you answer some questions? Thank you very much for the questions. Uh, with regard to the credit, under the Tokyo's uh, program, it's the, uh, the negotiated process. So the, with regard to the credit, there is a third party verification organization. And then, uh, then after their verification, credits are issued. OK, do you, what a, so the second question. Do you have long term uh, the monitoring system for certified companies? Yes, thank you. As for long term monitoring, the TMG system has an uh, a effective term of five years, and during that five years, the TMG will monitor and uh, verify the results. So, for example, the top level certification systems and others uh, will be run by the TMG against these covered facilities, so the TMG does undertake uh, strict supervision and monitoring. Question, what were the feedbacks from the certified companies? And is this usable for the other, com uh, other cities? Yes, thank you. The covered facilities, well, 70% of these facilities have given us a positive feedback that they were very happy to have participated in the scheme. So uh, from the covered facilities, I believe we have been able to gain deep understanding about the TMG's initiatives. And we got the last question from the floor. Last question is, is it permitted to use external carbon credit to meet the target under the Tokyo Cap and Trade Scheme? If not, why and what's the plan for future? Yes, thank you. For external carbon credits, the green power certificate can be used as credit for the scheme. So going forward, we would like to widen or expand uh, the use of external carbon credits. We are currently studying the possibility. Much. I think the time is out. I think, of course, we can spend more time to ask several questions. Actually, I prepared several questions, but no time to do it. But for the audience people, I think maybe if you have any follow-up questions, I can you can send uh, the question, and then we could uh, just uh, consolidate uh, the question to the, uh, the Mr. Aoki, and then we could answer. But thank you very much, Mr. Aoki, and it's a very useful uh, presentation. And Joe, thank you very much for the excellent comment. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I think maybe now we need to move to the next session. Victor is correct? Okay, now I think it's time to go to the next session. Next session is session two, Accelerating Clean Energy Transition Through the Emission Trading Scheme, Case of Thailand. And then again, as some of you know, Thailand is one of the early movers in the ASEAN countries uh, in terms of carbon pricing. 
and then Thailand has already uh, quickly uh, started their voluntary uh, ETS system in 2010, and then voluntary credit, credit, credit program in 2013. So Thailand has lots of experiences. And then the ASEAN peers, now they're look carefully looking at Thailand, what's going on. So today we are luckily, we have the excellent speaker from Thailand Greenhouse Gas Management Organization, Mr. Satom, uh, Charia Pugut Satom, the carbon market manager. And then I think uh, that we can hear the, what is uh, the, the experience about Thailand, uh, Thailand voluntary emission, uh, emission trading system from him. And also we have a commentator uh, from the World Bank, Mr. Hari Kumar Gade. He's a senior climate change specialist. He is also expert of carbon pricing. Okay, Mr. Fatum, floor is yours. Sorry, Cap. Good morning, everyone. Really nice to meet you. So first, let me share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes. Yes. So let me start. Uh, first of all, I, I, I would like to explain my sincere thanks to the World Bank, TDLC, and their partner for inviting me to join the sessions. And I'm pleased uh, to share our perspective on how the ATS can accelerate, can green energy transition with you. So let me start my presentation with our launching on the framework of the national energy plan according to the national policy, uh, energy policy council, which uh, addresses that Thailand will move toward and aim to achieve its carbon neutrality in 2065 to 2070. However, recently on November 1st, 2021, at COP26, the Thai Prime Minister General Vijut Chan had expressed that Thailand's uh, willingness to be more aggressive in addressing climate change using every means possible in order to achieve carbon neutral in 2050 and the zero emission on or before uh, 2065 and with adequate timely and equitable technology transfer and cooperation and the most important uh, access to amber green finance facility. Thailand can increase its national determined contribution to 40% and reach the net zero emission in 2050. Thus, uh, Thailand's uh, low carbon development pathway uh, will become more stringent shortly. Regarding the national energy plan and its frameworks, the promotion on uh, investment in the green energy of, of the energy sector has been addressed uh, several measures, including increase the proportion of the new electricity generation to at least 50% uh, of renewable energy and consider injunction with the cost of long-term energy storage system. Uh, the second is the change the use of transportation in the transport sector to be more green, uh, to be uh, electric uh, vehicle technology according to the policy of uh, 30 at 30 to increase the ability to reduce greenhouse gas and to solve the weather problem uh, from uh, PM 2.5, which uh, become more serious in our country. Uh, third is uh, improve energy efficiency by more than 30% uh, by applying modern energy management technology and innovation. And uh, fourth, uh, restructure the energy industry to support energy transition trend according to the uh, the 4D1E uh, guideline, which means uh, decarbonization, digitalization, decentralization, deregulation, and electrification. So for next slide, uh, as you can see, uh, since the global warming on uh, achieving 1.5 degrees Celsius and the zero emission target was intensified, Thailand has formulated its long-term carbon reduction pathway uh, this pathway uh, demonstrate condition and policy option toward the country's net zero emission target with a foreign and measure specifically on uh, emission removal through the forestation. As a result of this pathway, it is recommended that uh, to achieve the country net zero emission, the implementation of the 
initial removal by forestation shall be absorbed approximately 120 million tan carbon dioxide equivalent uh, referred to the Ministry of uh, National Resort and Environment Plan and need a progressive reduction of approximately 15, 7.1 and 6.2 uh, million tan carbon dioxide equivalent per year according to the uh, 2050, 2075, and 2080 pathway, respectively. Uh, <clears throat> this slide, uh, let me show you uh, in detail of the sectoral mitigation option, which could potentially be addressed in the long-term carbon reduction pathway of our country. For the energy and transportation sector, it is found that uh, decarbonization electricity and heat which is uh, consistent with the uh, shifting to uh, fossil fuel based energy to be renewable energy has been addressed and could be significant approach that relate to the carbon pricing mechanism in enabling uh, the low carbon energy transition for our country. So uh, how much should the energy sector reduce its emission in order to achieve the country in a zero emission target in time? Uh, according to the preliminary analysis of the long-term carbon reduction pathway and scenario. It was found that uh, the energy sector shall reduce their carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emission as of uh, 151.9 and uh, 233.9 million tons respectively according to the, the respect uh, time frame of the net zero carbon dioxide for carbon neutrality scenario and for the net a zero greenhouse gas uh, uh, emission, as you see in the slide. However, according to the declaration of our country in the COP26, maybe it's maybe earlier, uh, five to 10 years. That's mean uh, we have to accelerate our, our framework and scenario shortly. Uh, let me share with you on the electricity generation generation profile of our country. As you can see from this slide, uh, whereas type of fuel are consumed by the power sector, uh, the main fuel used in the power sector are natural gas and coal, while uh, in 2017, the power sector was the largest emitter in Thailand, which account for 36% of the total carbon dioxide emission from the country's uh, fuel combustion. The total electricity generation and consumption has increased continually. continually. Uh, Why is uh, carbon dioxide emission intensity decreased as well? Uh, furthermore, the improvement, uh, according to the improvement of our Thailand National Power Development Plan and its formulation uh, to attain uh, and support the country and its roadmap. It's indicated that the, the power sector is required to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emission by uh, 24 million ton carbon dioxide equivalent, which is equivalent to 20% of the total emission reduction goal as required uh, by the long-term carbon reduction pathway and scenario. That means, uh, therefore, the power sector needs to push more ambitious task and effort on increasing its uh, emission mitigation. And at this point, the carbon pricing instrument, uh, especially uh, specifically ETS, uh, could possibly help uh, enable and accelerate its reduction enhance enhancement through a cap, cap and trade mechanism, as well as uh, low carbon investment and renew and revenue uh, in transition to uh, greener and renewable energy. So uh, let me share with you more about the current, the current and expect carbon pricing instrument framework, which in our countries has been developed and implemented. As you can see from this slide, uh, we are we have a led one national plan and policy framework that can support and attain to achieve the commitment according to the Paris Agreement goal. Under this umbrella, there are development and implementation on uh, carbon pricing for both demand side and supply side through the various scheme and implementation project, such as uh, Thailand Carbon Offsetting Program, a low carbon community promotion, 
the Thailand Voluntary Emission Reduction, uh, the Thailand Voluntary uh, Emission Trading Scheme. And for this fiscal year, uh, we have implemented the project uh, for, for expanding our approach on uh, Thailand Voluntary Emission uh, Trading Scheme and Thailand Voluntary Emission Reduction uh, to enable uh, carbon trading and investment in uh, Eastern uh, Economic Cor Corridor in our country. Uh, we have also formulate and implement the trading platform with incorporate with the Thai uh, federal uh, federation in uh, the federation of uh, Thai industry in order to support our domestic carbon market among private and public organizations as well. So uh, regarding the context of the Thailand voluntary emission trading scheme uh, pilot implementation project, uh, or we call uh, TWET, its roadmap was, uh, was uh, developed and deployed. Uh, there's uh, uh, several uh, uh, relevant study projects uh, uh, were conducted uh, since uh, 2010. The TGO has developed MRV system for the Thailand Voluntary Emission uh, Trading Scheme uh, since two, 2013. The first year, we are uh, implement the pilot test uh, project for testing the MRV system uh, uh, for four industrial sector, including cement, power and paper, iron and steel, uh, petrochemical. We also exercise how to set the cap and how to uh, allocate the allowance allocation uh, for corporate uh, facility. We expand to the second pilot phase uh, during 2018 to 2020 for test uh, MRV and the uh, operation operating uh, rule for the voluntary ETS uh, in uh, five additional industrial sector, uh, which are uh, petroleum refinery, grass, plastic, food and feed, ceramic. Uh, and in 2020, uh, uh, the, the MA, MRV for other three industrial sectors, including textile, beverage, floating gas, uh, were developed uh, and uh, implemented uh, for testing and uh, uh, exercise whether uh, this ETS uh, uh, fits for the industrial sector in our country conflict or, or not. Uh, during the time, uh, there's a lot of uh, seminar meeting that we are uh, conduct uh, to uh, to uh, to conduct our uh, public uh, participation with uh, stake with, with uh, various stakeholder as well as uh, consideration of potential element of ETS uh, to be outlined in the climate uh, in the climate change acts of our country. Uh, we propose the recommendation and uh, for uh, for include. This uh this element in 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 the acts, and it and it is expected to be uh, proposed for the cabinet's uh consideration in in the end of this year, December 2020, 2021. Uh, in addition, uh, as part of the Thailand partnership for market renewed, uh, Ticho has conducted a study on the uh, appropriate formulation of the legislation on the ETS and reporting. So currently is uh, proposed uh, this, uh, we have proposed this tab raw uh, for report and how to distribute the estimate in our country for consideration at the policy level, as well as uh, the feasibility study on implementing the energy performance certification as a alternative choice. Uh, the power sector is also uh, uh, engaged. We invite them to join our pilot implementation project for Thailand water emission trading in the first phase and found that and found that uh, the context of the domestic electric, electricity market in our country, in our country is uh, dominated and regulated uh, via the heat rate and uh, contact tune equipment by the electricity generating authority of Thailand. So it might not uh, liberate in, uh, in, in our country because they have some uh, regulation by the regulator to, to control this kind of uh, the price, uh, the, the volume of electricity uh, to secure our uh, uh, energy consumption in our country. Uh, uh, furthermore, uh, Mr. Patton, sorry, you have two minutes left. 
Oh, okay. Furthermore, this is a uh, there are some significant research under the support from the IEA uh, on the potential role of uh, carbon pricing in the Thailand power sector, which is indicate that the carbon pricing is around uh, 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 30 uh, just a lot per ton in 2013 could achieve from a uh, coal to gas and 40 uh, US dollar per ton uh, could incentivize the chip of uh, 30, 33 uh, terawatt of the coal to uh, gas and reduce carbon emission from this is generated by 11 uh, percent so there are some uh, research that's, that that provide to us that if we can put the prion carbon in power sector, it could be a significant role for the country to reduce the greenhouse gas and accelerate uh, uh, the transition of energy, uh, conventional to, to be a greener energy you know, in our country. So within this year, we also uh, uh, implement the pilot project in our Eastern Corridor that I mentioned earlier. So I skip this slide. So this is uh, our challenge that, that I try to share with you. I think uh, 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 the carbon pricing, uh, uh, carbon shipping, uh, specifically ETS has, has not been created in, in our country, in, in our Thailand national policy framework and its long-term uh, strategic plan. Uh, second point is the electricity market in Thailand was dominated and controlled by the ICAT authority and its contact with the expansion earlier, so it does not liberate. Uh, the implementing ETS copper power sector might need more consideration in the detail of our complexity and optimized portion between heat rate and cap level. So to implement ETS in, the, in our country, the ETS uh, administrative cost could be higher than taxation. I may need to assign a new authorized uh, agency for its administration and oversight. Uh, another point is increasing electricity supply due to the ETS implementation to influence less consumption on the demand side. However, attention cost uh, to reflect the carbon price can possibly bring into the political issue that leads to its burdens. Uh, some uh, recommendation on this uh, challenge is uh, the revenue from ETS could be merged into the overall national revenue, but uh, might not allocate to its relevant climate measure. So uh, this should be a career at this if uh, we uh, we conduct the ETS in our near future. So uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fathom. Thank you so much. Okay, Harry, for is yours. Please make it compact. Thanks a lot. So thank you, Taisei. Uh, good, good morning, all. Uh, thank you so much uh, you know, for the opportunity to comment and also Mr. Fatum for making an excellent presentation updating the Thailand, uh, where Thailand is and what the future plans are. As uh, evidenced from the presentation, uh, it is clear that Thailand is making uh, serious efforts to take the country towards a sustainable future. And also, of course, the TCO supports are you know, highly commendable uh, for their tireless work to, to develop the MRV system and also now the efforts to introduce uh, uh, ETS uh, in the power sector, among many other initiatives. I think one thing that is, uh, uh, at least I noticed, is the you know, country's recent shift in the power sector planning, you know, from dependency on coal to natural gas over the next two decades. Uh, however, it lowers the overall emissions pathway. Uh, they, you know, the, slides show from 555 million tons to 440 million tons. But I think Thailand should make an effort to avoid you know, fossil fuel lock-in, uh, you know, as that could delay meaningful decarbonization efforts. Having said that one, I mean, it's like, you know, it's very, you know, encouraged and quite optimistic to see that, you know, the, the National you know, for Climate Change Framework and then the Climate Change Act, a National Energy Plan, and then long-term uh, you know, emissions development strategy uh, they're all going to put the country in, in definitely in the right path. As also Mr. Fata mentioned, carbon pricing definitely going to play a key role in incentivizing low carbon investment if well implemented. And uh, uh, some of you may know Thailand was a part of the World Bank's partnership for market readiness and uh, that support helped also to, to increase the capacity and readiness uh, to implement certain domestic carbon pricing initiatives mentioned in the presentation. 
and it's very encouraging to see the progress and future plans to take them forward. I think the challenges you know, mentioned to implement carbon pricing, especially in the power sector by Mr. Fatima, are very important you know, to consider. Uh, and and, uh, and of course, these, these are actually also observed in other countries. You know, implementing carbon pricing in the power sector, especially if it is regulated by electricity markets, is going to be highly challenging you know, compared to unregulated and open markets. You know, to to avoid market players from exiting the you know, markets, as as we've seen in during the voluntary ETS pilot, and uh, to provide necessary incentives, uh, I think the Thailand government should look into the structure of the sector, uh, the power purchase arrangements, the technology options, fuel mix, and regulations. Uh, definitely, the lessons learned from the voluntary scheme should be carefully considered for implementation uh, now of the full scale in the country. And as also uh, shown uh, the IEA study uh, for Thailand, uh, it projects that the $30 per ton is needed you know, to incentivize coal to gas switch over and $40 is you know, needed to further this and support achieving 11% reductions. Now, as the power, Thailand's power sector needs 20% reductions, like next to business as usual, and with the political and social challenges, uh, you know, with ensuring that you know, the, we achieve $30 or $40 ton of carbon pricing, I think the task is very ambitious, and uh, and hence you know, Thailand needs a suite of you know suite of other policies to support this goal in addition to you know the the carbon pricing uh, instruments. Um, in addition to of course the well-intentioned policies that are mentioned, I think that a major scale up in financing is also needed to meet countries' you no know, clean energy transition. Um, so both from the domestic and international public and uh, private source of finance. Uh, carbon pricing definitely could help with raising revenues and support some of these resource needs you know, in addition to helping in, you know, address any distributional impacts, especially on low-income households. As an increasing number of countries and corporates are pledging stringent commitments to climate action and sustainable development, uh, I think Thailand will need to continue its clean energy transition if it is to meet its carbon neutrality goal in 2065-2070. As IEA recently said, you know, ambitions count for little if they are not implemented successfully. And also based on the experience, at least, you know, there is one lesson that we learned from various you know, countries' experience, that is, you know, there is no silver bullet, and, and a multifaceted approach to you know, deep decarbonization is essential. And I'm sure Thailand is no different from this. Uh, so I thank so once again for the opportunity to comment, and also for, for them, Mr. Watham for making this excellent presentation. Thank you. Over to you, Taisei. Thank you, Harry. So for the interest of the time, I think maybe I just pick up one question from the floor. So one question to you, Mr. Fatham, is I believe I just did put the external cost, including social costs, etc., into internal cost is important as you present. I'd like to know how would you like to calculate it? Could you kind of quickly explain? Of course, you know, not much detail. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Actually, uh, in, in, in our country, we are for uh, macro scale, we have uh, several results on, on uh, impact uh, for both economic and social impact if we implement the, the common pricing at the uh, uh, national and organization level. And uh, I think uh, in the recent years, uh, last year and this year, we also uh, implement uh, some, mac uh, some uh, capacity capacity building about the internal carbon pricing, which at least uh, various uh, internal costs, uh, that include the social choice, cost, uh, social costs and environmental costs in the uh, operation of the, the organization. So we recruit some organization to uh, to conduct this uh, pilot implementation to, to learn on the internal carbon pricing and also uh, develop some guidelines for, for our in, industrial sector with the support of World Bank as well. Thank you so much. So we learned a lot from, from this uh, implementation project. So this is the knowledge that we, we gain from the, 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 uh, the implementation and uh, information that we gain from our uh, expert. I'm not sure I'm uh, answer this question or not, but uh, to to uh, to talk to tell you about the methodology is uh, very detailed. So uh, maybe uh, in 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 specific point, uh, you can uh, send email to me so I can uh, find out in in whether uh, issue that I can respond in the future. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Fasama. Thank you so much. I'm sorry we have to say they're going to the next session due to the time, but thank you very much, Mr. Fasama. And to the audience, if you have any follow-up question, uh, please send it to us. We can consolidate and we can transfer it to the Mr. Fasama. Thank you so much. Let me go to the next session. So next session is the changing the way to do the business. Private sector is supposed to the Tokyo cap and trade program. The past two sessions, actually, the, the, the explanation of the cap and trade program or ETS from the government viewpoint. But uh, this time, with the, I think we'd like to hear the private sector's voice, because I think in the, at the end of the day, the, to make the carbon price effective and efficient, the stakeholders' engagement is quite important. That is why we are very glad to hear the voices from, the, say, the, uh, one company who is participating in Tokyo Cap and Trade Program. Their less grant will be very helpful to the say, government, the government policy makers, and the private sector in the developing countries as well. We are today. We have uh, say, a good speaker from uh, the uh, Canon IT Solutions, Mr. Koichiro Gunda. And then uh, he is uh, the, the uh, senior general manager at the data center uh, service group, Canon IT Solutions. And you also have a good commentator from the IFC, International Finance Corporation, Mr. Chuen Gwen, a principal operation officer uh, in the Southeast. He's taking care of the private sector corporation, uh, there's a collaboration in the Southeast Asia. So, Mr. Gunda, who is yours? Thank you so much. Thank you, Matsuki-san. Hello, uh, my name is Koichiro Gunda from Canon IT Solutions. I am the senior general manager of data center service group, uh, the head of Canon IT Solutions data center. Uh, it is an honor to have this opportunity to talk today. I would like to share our efforts concerning the Tokyo Metropolitan Government Cap and Trade Program and our actions against our environment. Today's agenda is as shown. After a quick overview of our company, I'd like to share some actions we have taken towards the cap and trade program and also our efforts for energy saving. Uh, lastly, uh, explain, explain about our future plan. First, uh, I would like to explain the position of Canon IT Solutions incorporated within the Canon Group. Canon IT Solutions is one of the group company of Canon Marketing Japan Inc. Canon Marketing Japan is a subsidiary of Canon Inc. and is responsible for marketing and providing service and the support of both Canon brand and the non-Canon brand products in its territory, Japan. Uh, Canon IT Solutions provides system integration uh, consultation and uh, develops and uh, distributes various software. Its business consists of mainly, mainly five segments, uh, SI, uh, private cloud, uh, managed service, security, and the data center. Data center business, which I will be focusing on today, is performed at our data center located, located in Tokyo. Uh, data center is a dedicated facility where IT devices are not dispersed, but collected and placed it efficient op operation. At Can IT Solutions, we are keeping and operating IT device assets of various customers. Because we are keeping assets of our customers, uh, there are many points and details I cannot refer to today for confidential information protection reasons. Your kind understanding would be appreciated. Uh, Kano IT Solutions Data Center is located in Nishi Tokyo. Uh, by the way, Nishi means West in Japanese. Building number one was completed in 2012 and the building number two in 2020. The data center is about 20 kilometers away from the center of Tokyo. Its good accessibility is one of its characteristics. By collecting or gathering dispersed IT device, devices of each company's data center is realizing energy efficiency as a whole society. According to the Japan Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, by shifting companies to use data center from holding its own server room, 
leads to 20 to 40 percent of a re reduction of carbon dioxide. On the other hand, buildings of data center are treated as facilities which emit many CO2. In 2013, Nishitokyo Data Center was appointed as a reporting facility. And three years later, in year 2016, it was appointed as a compliance facility. Ah, oh, sorry. Uh, besides reducing CO2 emission obligation of TMG, uh, through various activities at our Nish Tokyo data center, we are making efforts to further reduce CO2. As a result, a building number one was appointed as an outstanding facility in its degree of promoting measures against global warming, uh, which means it was certified as a nearly top level facility by TMG. Next about our sustainability management. A Canon group uh, based on the philosophy of Kyosei, uh, we strive together with all of its stakeholders to create a company that helps realize a society in which all of humanity can long live, work and live happily together. Uh, Kyosei means harmonious coexistence in English. For areas in environment, we are contributing to decrease burden to the environment in offering and by leveraging IT, uh, saving energy consumption of cons customers by their use of data center and by saving paper resource by digitization, et cetera. Uh, next about our environmentally friendly efforts at Nish Tokyo data center. There are three major points uh, first, saving energy in everyday lives, uh, same and common measures uh, as taken at general buildings. For example, uh, thinning out lighting in hallways at night, uh, controlling light by motion detection systems, and adjusting air condition, air condition temperature setting, and so on. Uh, next point is specific to data center. At Nish Tokyo Data Center, we are providing optimal environment for IT devices by supplying stable power and maintaining constant temperature and human humidity. Uh, to do so, we have implemented large scale, uh, but highly effective and uh, environment friendly air conditioning and electrical equipment. They have been selected from the stage of a building planning. Uh, and we conduct free cooling in winter season and are optimizing the operation of air conditioning equipment in line with IT load. Additionally, we are holding meetings to consider how we can further save energy. Uh, meetings are held once a month and uh, members in charge of the facility management are attending. Uh, besides checking whether current efforts are effective, they consider what other measures can be taken. A general manager of Nishitoka office is attending the meeting. Uh, therefore, uh, decisions are made immediately and actions can start from the next month. Results of the actions are reviewed promptly. Uh, I would like to explain about optimizing operation of air conditioning according to IT load uh, performed at our data center. The air conditioner installed at our data center is able to properly operate according to uh, the cyber room condition automatically controls temperature and airflow. However, uh, we not only rely on machine performance, but also uh, add uh, human detailed adjustments to save further uh, energy. Uh, in concrete terms, in line with the load of server room, we are lowering rotational frequency of the air conditioner by uh, adjusting the room temperature manually. A lowering rotational frequency is equal to lowering current value and that therefore uh, has energy saving effect. In addition, we check installed machines, for example, uh, check status of aisle containment, uh, check installation status of a blank panel, etc. Our data center server room is structured uh, to let cold air blow from the floor. Uh, so we consider the best position to set panels for wind to uh, flow efficiently. According to the load of IT devices mounted on server racks, 
but we consider where to set floor opening panel and are trying to save energy by improving air conditioning efficiency. Next about our efforts on the cap and trade program. Pursuant to this program, our company is enforced to reduce CO2 emission. Uh, to meet the requirement, we have set annual goals and are conducting the uh, energy, energy saving activities I have shared up to now. Energy saving actions lead uh, to reduce electricity charges and etc., and eventually link to our company's profit. Uh, please see the graph. The green line shows the CO2 emission cap set by TMG, and the blue bar is the actual uh, total emission of Nishitokyo data center. Uh, the, uh, the red ar arrows uh, show how low we were able to press down the amount of CO2 emission uh, compared to the cap set by TMG. Under the cap and trade program, the red arrow portion can be possessed as credits. Credits it can be used in many ways, such as uh, banking credits for future use, uh, trading with other companies, as well as donating to TMG. Uh, during 2018 to 2020, TMG asked to donate CO2 emission reduction credits for offsetting emissions related to Tokyo 2020 games. We agreed to cooperate, uh, and in 2019, we donated about 20,000 a uh, ton of CO2 from the credits accumulated from 2016 to 2018. From now on as well, we hope to keep making social contributions in addition to CO2 reduction. As shown, Nishitokyo Data Center have utilized the TMG cap and trade program in two aspects to set reduction targets and uh, for social contribution. Thanks to this program, our company was able to accelerate our corporate actions for the environment. I believe this program is a good motivator for business owners. In regards uh, to the environmentally friendly efforts, in March 2021, Nish Tokyo Data Center Building Number no. 1 was certified as nearly top level facility by TMG. Our data center and one another data center are the only two data centers that hold this certification as of tw March uh, 2021. Uh, to be satis certified uh, based on daily operation and the facility information, uh, certain evaluation criteria factors needs, need to be met among the more than 200 evaluation criteria factors. Therefore, we collect operation data and the facility information, uh, facility information related to the, to the uh, evaluation criteria factors from our daily operation. We analyze whether each TMG's evaluation criteria factor is met. In 2016, uh, building number one was appointed as compliance facility by TMG and we became obliged to reduce carbon dioxide in order not to be obliged uh, the only choice to become a non-compliance facility. However, uh, because electricity usage increases according to customer increase of a data center, uh, we cannot be exempted from reduction obligation. By obtaining a nearly top level facility certification, the reduction obligation uh, becomes eased. After three years of reviewing our operation, uh, we, we became certified. In reviewing our operation or analyzing evaluation criteria factors, we did not use consultants or third-party companies and did it all by ourselves. The members who manage and operate the data center deepened their understandings of our facility by repeated trial and error and achieved today's outcome. Uh, lastly, about our future actions toward decarbonization. Uh, according to the Agency for uh, Natural Resource and Energy, uh, data centers in Japan consume about 34 billion kilowatt hour, uh, which is about 4% of the entire Japanese electricity consumption. The Japanese government is stating to reduce CO2 emissions by 46% compared to 2013 by year 2030. Uh, data centers as well uh, need to further pursue energy saving and CO2 reduction. 
our company, Canon IT Solutions, besides pursuing saving energy by leveraging advanced technology towards decarbonization, leaves to hold the energy saving mind strongly at both data center provider side and the data center user side is essential. Under the Canon Group philosophy, Kyosei, uh, we would like to do from small to big as much as we can to reduce CO2 for the global environment. We will keep thinking what we can do now and what we need to do for the future and continue to seek improvements. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gunder. It's very interesting and very encouraging. Okay, Twen, you have the floor. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gunder. Um, as I'm based in Vietnam, of course, there are many Canon factories uh, around Hanoi making printers. And as you know, within World Bank Group, our, our focus is support the clients in the developing countries. Um, and so the, it's really great, your example, in terms of the uh, best in class efficiency for the data center. And hopefully those examples can be shared and apply to similar facilities uh, in emerging markets. Um, but the comment I want to, to share, and I know Canon is a very big group, um, and, uh, but you know, it's something that we are looking in an ambitious way in the decarbonization, because um, with the whole value chain uh, of every company, not just Canon, but whatever manufacturing companies, whether it's uh, clothing or electronics, um, you know, or agriculture, many of the value chain production is uh, in the emerging markets. So, you know, what we would call the scope three. Uh, and I know Canon, uh, as with many multinational, have committed to net zero uh, under SBTI uh, for 20, uh, uh, I think, I believe 2050. Um, and so that means uh, perhaps decarbonizing 30, 40, 50 percent uh, by 2030. Uh, and a lot of that will require uh, support for decarbonizing scope three at your suppliers, your factories, uh, you know, like the ones uh, in, in Vietnam. Now, this obviously for all companies is the most complex solution uh, because you are not in control of the suppliers. You do not own them. Uh, they may be third party uh, manufacturers. Um, so this is an area which IFC, World Bank, are trying to find solutions, uh, whether it's through advice that we can provide directly to the factories in the emerging markets, uh, as well as climate financing that we can bring for those uh, factories and those assets in the emerging markets. Because as they decarbonize, it will contribute significantly to the whole Canon carbon footprint and achieve your net zero uh, uh, target. So this one last thing to share, we recently um, signed an agreement with Microsoft to help their big suppliers in Asia uh, for their hardware and data center uh, starting in Vietnam and India. So it will be complex, uh, but as you say, from small to big, uh, starting uh, in terms of looking at scope three, the tier one suppliers and working downward, I think we can make a huge difference uh, for the net zero commitment like companies like yourself, but also very importantly to the competitiveness of the suppliers in Vietnam or India or Indonesia, these countries that need to also uh, grow sustainably. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gunda for, for sharing. And um, I know we are limited in time, but it'd be great to hear some thoughts on, on your view on the Canon approach to scope three. Thank you. Thank you very much, Twen. I think maybe for just for the interest of the question, uh, the time, I think maybe I not received any question from the floor. In that case, maybe from my side, I'd like to have some, a couple questions. Oh, yes, one question uh, just here. <laughs> okay. Uh, are there, one question is, are there ways to gain CO2 reduction credits by increasing trees and landscape around the facilities? This is the question to you, Mr. Gunda.
。あのはい。えっ、ー、とあの私のこの制度の理解ではですね。あの With regard to my understanding of this program is that it is not possible to gain credit through addressing the frustration and other landscape around the facilities. So it only Uh, the only way to get the credit is to achieve the excess reduction or buy from other、uh, co companies. Thank you very much. Then, only one question from my side. Well, so, the, how did、uh, your company's participation in the Tokyo Cap and Trade program impact the, your say, goal setting and implementation plan of the Canon? Uh, Marketing Japan Group 2025 vision. I want to know what is the impact cap and trade participation in your company's long term strategy? Thank you for that question. The Canon Marketing Japan Group wants to resolve or help resolve social issues through its business operations to maintain the sustainable maintenance of its business value. And our participation in the Tokyo Cap and Trade program this time did not directly affect. The Canon Marketing Japan Group 2025 vision. So there was no direct impact, I must say. However, by participating in this system, are the employees' awareness toward the environment and ecology、uh, was enhanced very greatly so that they more aggressively participated in energy efficiency initiatives,、uh, helping us to reduce CO2 even beyond our. Targets, and that I think in itself would lead to contribution to decarbonization.、Uh, so, in that sense, I believe that it, it did affect or it was in alignment with the company's overall vision and its wish to resolve social issues. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Gundar. So, the,、uh, it's unfortunate I need to stop right here because now it's, the time is very strict. So, I think maybe I'd like to、uh, conclude our session and again, I'd like to give the floor to the,、uh, Victor. But once again, thank you very much for the all speakers. Thank you so much. So thank you so much, Taisei, and all the speakers that participated.、Uh, that was a very uh, uh, rich. Uh, presentations that、uh, give a very good overview、uh, of、uh, cap and trade, starting from、um, uh, Tokyo all the way to a company like、uh, Canon in in Vietnam. So, so we could see the the whole process. So, thank you so much for everyone.、Um, and now、uh, we are going to、uh, go to the、um, uh, the reflections and discussions. We are very、uh, pleased to have with us Mark Forney. Who is the lead disaster risk management specialist at the World Bank? He is joining us from Vietnam and he will share his reflections and discussions、uh, over the discussions that we had today. So, Mark, I would like to invite you now to the floor. Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you, Victor. You can hear me, right? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect.、Um, first, thank you for the opportunity to give some remarks and、I、thank. Thanks everybody who is involved in the TDLC for putting together a really interesting、um, set of presentations.、Uh, these types of good practices that are being implemented across、uh, East Asia are really helpful for us when we are engaging with our own clients and thinking about new and creative ways to have impact、uh, to reduce carbon footprints. Using various mechanisms、uh, in the in the climate finance space, and you know this is a topic that is so much more urgent now than it was a few years ago. As as we see,、um, you know, not a lot of not a lot of progress in in the international system with regards to how it is that we're going to achieve. The necessary emission reductions、uh, that are required to avoid、uh, climate crisis in the coming decades. 
Um, and what I what I think is especially interesting about these presentations is the the entities that are taking action, because as I mentioned, there's not a lot of progress um, in the international sphere. There's not necessarily a lot of progress with national governments around the world, or there is, but you know it's a little bit inconsistent. And seeing uh, subnational governments put in systems to be able to take action on their own is is another piece of the puzzle that is required for us to all collectively, you know, move in the direction to decarbonization. Um, and so while the inter that international system continues negotiations, while national governments put in place policies and incentives, action on the ground, uh, where, where city governments and subnational governments are closest uh, to uh, the, the actual impact uh, of, of climate change, their own assets, uh, the assets that they govern um, in, the, in the private sector, seeing them play a role is, is, is somewhat new in, in the, the world with which uh, we work within the World Bank and our client governments. And it's something that's starting in um, some of the more developed countries. But this is something we really need to, as the World Bank group, explore more. And we need to find these interesting solutions using different types of carbon finance markets with the city uh, as the key enabler, facilitator, and actor on its own assets, as well as supporting and incentivizing the uh, uh, carbon reduction of private assets. And just to give an example of how this is starting to move forward, um, and what the total impact of this could be. I just want to give a case in, in the developed world in uh, uh, a city in New York State called Ithaca. Um, it's a town of about 30,000 people. And this town of 30,000 people has committed to reduce uh, energy consumption of all public and private buildings in the city. And they've raised $100 million to be able to do this uh, about two months ago. And their city council has just approved the plan to move forward um, last week. And this is a program that the city itself is helping to reduce the transaction costs and the information asymmetries between the experts that uh, understand how to decarbonize buildings and the, um, the individual uh, asset owners, building owners themselves. And the role that the city can play to enable the efficient interventions at scale to make it easy for private actors, household owners, business owners to take action uh, is, is a key ingredient on top of the different opportunities for climate finance. But let's put this in context, $100 million of investment in a town of 30,000 people. If we take a step back, what is that opportunity overall in the United States? That's more than $1 trillion of investment to increase the efficiency of buildings. And we know that buildings are uh, you know, accountable for 28, 29% of global emissions and a, a big majority in, in, of emissions in most cities. This type of mechanism, the, that has a potential to scale, to move a trillion dollars of investment is impact. And that impact driven by cities, driven by accessing the debt markets in this case in efficient ways, the, um, as well as providing the uh, way forward for individual uh, household owners, as well as businesses to give guidance about what actions they need to take for investments that ultimately make financial sense. They make financial sense because of energy savings over time. And you know, this is another type of example of cities taking the lead, reducing the transaction costs, helping actors, private actors, uh, make decisions to make investments to be more efficient and competitive in the future and to save money. And the more conversations that we can have about learning from good practices whether of, of um, you know, city level uh, initiatives and programs that are taking action now 
uh, taking action before the international system is fully you know, uh, aligned and moving forward is really encouraging. And that's something we want to do more of. And um, you know, very much look forward to continuing learning about other experiences around the world and how it is that we can deploy those types of experiences of good practice um, to, to our client countries who um, may not have as much access to information as, um, you know, as, as, as all the folks here um, making the presentations do. And that's where TDLC plays such an important role in trying to facilitate these conversations, to share these ideas, to start to think about how they can be applied in other contexts. Um, so you know, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to participate uh, in, in this session and to learn and uh, look forward to thinking about how those ideas and concepts can be translated to clients in Vietnam, as well as other clients uh, in, in East Asia and around the world. Uh, thank you very much. So thank you very much, Mark, uh, for these uh, closing reflections and uh, bringing us just to, to wrap up the, the, the event uh, with these thoughts. Um, I wanted to uh, take the opportunity to thank again uh, Taise Matsuki for his help in curating this event and the overall series that uh, uh, we are doing together uh, between himself and Mario Meta, uh, which is the other lead uh, of the World Bank that is curating uh, the content. And this was a very rare chance to have Taise live in the Asia schedule because he's based in DC and we really appreciate him being with here, here with us today. So with this, we conclude the event, uh, but please stay tuned for our future events as we continue exploring the path towards low carbon cities together. More details will be shared by emails and posts on TDLC webpage. Let me finish with a big thank you to all our speakers and to you, our participants, for joining us in this conversation. Have a great day and goodbye.